Thank you, Sarah. That was brilliant. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, some of you joined us earlier on for the session with Cormac Russell, uh, which was really thought provoking, really interesting. This is the second of today's sessions. Um, we've chosen to focus a whole day on social isolation and loneliness just because it is the top overall priority for the Suffolk Community Partnerships and it's clearly very important and, and I guess even more so given what's happened in the last um, few months and, um, and, and given the, the, the lockdown that we're about to go back into from Thursday of this week. So uh, what we wanted to do was, was highlight some of the um, work that's going on around isolation and loneliness nationally. And then we've got the session at two o'clock this afternoon is much more of a focus on what's happening locally in East Suffolk. But hopefully the different sessions kind of dovetail together and, and, and work together. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Kim, who's leading today's session. Um, and apologies to Kim for, um, for spelling your name wrong on the information. So um, and big apologies for, for, for that, because I know how annoying that can be. Um, but Kim's an ambassador for the Joe Cox Foundation, has been since July 2016, and also director of More in Common, Batley and Spen. But I'm going to let her talk to you all about that, because she can do the introduction much better than I can. Um, I think Kim's going to talk to us for a while, um, but then there will be an opportunity for question and answer sessions. So either Kim or I will explain how people can put their hands up to, to ask questions. So over to you, Kim. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And hello, everybody down there in East Suffolk. It's lovely to see you all. Um, I'm coming live from Batley and Spen in West Yorkshire. I actually live in a little village called Liversidge, which is um, just sort of in the constituency that, that Joe represented, which is where I still live, where we, we grew up. Um, I'm feeling under an awful lot of pressure to follow Cormac Russell, who <laughs> not only is extremely amazing with pretty much every word that comes out of his mouth, but has also got the most wonderful accent ever as well. So my, uh, my Yorkshire dialect is feeling a little bit inadequate but I will do my best for you and I'll try and avoid too many e-by gums and talk of whippets and such like um so yeah it's a real pleasure to join this morning thank you ever so much for inviting me um for anybody on the call who might have seen me speak before I have a very informal style um, I'm very happy to make this interactive. Um, I'll speak for a bit and then I'll sort of ask if there's any questions and then and maybe speak for a little bit longer um, and then happy to take more questions at the end. Um, and I think someone sort of mentioned um, something which reminded me of this um, just before we started. Um, I really am speaking to you as human beings, first and foremost. I'm not speaking to you with your professional hats on. I know there's a variety of people on the call who have got a variety of roles um, across the area that you cover, but I always try and connect with people on a very human level. So I'm speaking to you as mums and dads and sons and daughters and aunties and uncles and brothers and sisters. So everything that I do really comes from, from that starting point rather than any sort of highfaluted kind of professional starting point, if that makes sense. Although clearly the work that you are all doing is hugely important. Um, I'm also very clear, you know, I'm, I'll talk about various different things, but I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, if I'm totally honest. But what I will do is I will tell you my story. I'll tell you, you know, what I've been doing in the last four, four years or so. Um, and I guess one of my main messages is, is about resilience. That's one of the key things that I, that I talk about and focus on. And actually, you know, has, has been alluded to already, you know, we all need resilience right now. Um, let's not shy away from the fact that times are tough for lots of us and for so, so many people across the country and indeed across the world. Um, so I think hopefully some of my horrific experience will enable me to talk a little bit about we, how we can all try and be as resilient as we possibly can be during the coming uh, months. So I'm going to share, start sharing my screen with you all. But the good thing is it means I can still see some of you, which is always good because I love seeing people's faces. I did something yesterday and you couldn't see anybody and you just have that sense of, is anybody there? But I can see you and that is really, really wonderful. Um, and feel free, as you've all probably got used to now with the zooming left, right and centre to use any of the little icons or any of the things or put some stuff in the chat if anything's on your mind. Happy to, to do all that. Um, and yeah, let's crack on, shall we? So, as has been said already, my name is Kim Ledbeater. 
I, and it doesn't matter about spelling it wrongly. It happens all the time. I'm not precious about it, but my granddad would have been most concerned. So I do have to mention it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Kim Ledbeater, I work as an ambassador for the Joe Cox Foundation uh, and I chair a volunteer group here in West Yorkshire called More in Common, Batley and Spen. And I do both those things because Joe Cox was my sister. And Joe, for anybody that doesn't know, was the MP for Batley and Spen who was murdered in June 2016. Um, and I'm really honest and open about the fact that I have not dealt with what's happened to our family. Um, on that day, our lives changed forever. And I know I've still got an awful lot of work to do in terms of processing what's happened. I think what I've done um, is just get my head down and just plow myself into work and trying to create a positive legacy for Joe focusing all the things that I still managed to have a little bit of control over instead of all the many things that that I just lost control over on that day uh, and again I guess that resonates with the current situations for so many of us um, I have just thought right there's so much of this that is out of my hands I can't think about that stuff I just have to think about what's in front of me and taking one day at a time and that's what I've tried to do um, and you know this was all new to me um, I'll tell you a little bit about my background, which actually I started my career in, in sales. Um, and then I found my real passion, which was in the health and fitness industry. So I did my degree a little bit later in life. I think I was 25 when I did my degree. Um, and I did my degree in physical activity and health and well-being. And what I found is a real passion for looking at well-being holistically. So looking at people's physical well-being, but their psychological, social, spiritual and overall um, well-being and I found that that was my real area of, of passion and when I graduated I went on to become a lecturer at a couple of local colleges actually teaching on the de degree program that I did um, so I lectured part-time and I also set up my own business as well so I used to teach um, exercise classes I used to teach a bit of boxercise and circuit training and my favorite of all was my cheesy 80s aerobics classes uh, where I'd get a bunch full of people mainly women occasionally we'd get the odd man who dared to join us dancing around to 80s pop music having a wonderful time um, and yes they were there for the physical benefits but they were also there hugely for the social benefits as well. Um, I also um, started doing one-to-one -one exercise sessions on a, an, as a personal trainer but really again because of my approach taking a very holistic approach so a bit more I guess you might call it modern day life coaching type stuff so looking after people's overall well-being um, and that was my real sort of passion um, for, for, for a long time. Um, I haven't taught any exercise classes since Joe got killed um, and that would feel a bit strange to me, I think, partly because Jo loved coming to my classes whenever she was up north. Um, and I remember one time she brought her little baby boy along and she was so desperate to have some exercise and some, some fun time with some other people that we just did the aerobics class around the little boy. And he was sort of crawling everywhere. And, 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 it, and it was wonderful. And I think, again, that shows the real power of physical activity to bring people together. Um, and it, and it, it fits in well with some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I still do a little bit of personal training and I think again what I've seen um, in recent months is that people need that connection more than ever because of everything that we're all going through. Um, I still play a bit of hockey and um, again my belief there in that that power of the sport to bring people together and I've got an amazing bunch of, of friends through that um, but you know I was new in 2016 to the voluntary sector I'd never worked in any sort of charitable capacity before I was new to campaigning and I was new to public speaking um, I mean, I've never been um, shy, but I've never done any sort of stuff like this before. And, you know, we said to Joe, when Joe got the job as our MP, we will support you, Joe. We will cook for you. We'll pick the kids up. We'll run around after you. We'll do all those things that you need. But we don't want anyone to know who we are. Me and mum and dad were very happy to stay behind the scenes and, you know, and just let Joe go out there and do her thing. Um, so this certainly wasn't the path that I would have chosen. Um, and indeed, um, I wasn't anything to do with party politics. I've always been particularly interested in politics um, and engaged, but not active. Um, that was the way that Joe had chosen to, to um, make a difference, um, but it wasn't something that I'd chosen to do. What I am and what I've always been, and this is where Joe and I were two peas in a pod, is very, very people focused, really interested in people, really you know, keen to know about people's stories and their backgrounds and what makes them tick. And, and I guess that's where you know, we, we, 
were always very, very similar. But what all that means really is I suppose I come to this sort of work now with absolutely no agenda because like I say, I loved my life and I didn't want anything to change. And I've ended up in these situations and I often think, gosh, what are you doing, Kim? <laughs> and if I'm honest, I often don't really know what I'm doing. You know, I've been on the telly and I've met famous people and all that sort of stuff. And I think, gosh, this is just bizarre. But actually what I'm trying to do, I suppose, in my own way is make a difference. And I guess that's kind of what, what keeps me going. And it's actually quite a, a liberating position to be in where you've got no agenda because, you know, the worst thing that could have happened to me has happened. So whatever I do, even though I'm often out of my comfort zone and I'm often, you know, feeling a little bit nervous and stuff, um, you know, I haven't got a huge amount to lose really. And, and for every single person that tells me that something I've said or done has made a difference, then it makes it worthwhile. So in terms of Joe, embarrassing picture time. Joe was genuinely one of the nicest, kindest, loveliest people you could hope to meet. And I know we always say that when, when, when we lose people, don't we? But actually, she really was. Now, she was really annoying as well. Let's be clear about that. She was very ditzy. Um, she never had any money. She never had the right clothes to wear. She forgot to take her bike on a cycling holiday, which none of us can still believe. And, and various other things like that, because she was always looking at the big picture. She was never really focused on the day to day bits and pieces of life that we all have to, to worry about. Um, but she was a really, really genuinely lovely person. What a lot of people don't know is um, that she was actually very shy when we were kids. And it may be difficult to believe, but I was the gobby one <laughs> and I was the one who would sort of, you know, she, she'd push me forward and say, oh, no, Kim, you do it, you do it. And even simple stuff like ringing up for a bus timetable or ordering a takeaway or, you know, stuff like that. And that for me makes what she went on to achieve even more impressive because she had to work hard. And I think often, particularly when I'm speaking to young people. I will tell that story about Joe because I think when we see people in the public eye, we often assume that they've always been confident and they've never had the nerves that actually we all have. Um, and I think it's really important for, for young people coming, coming through that they understand that sometimes we do have to all work hard at those things. And Joe was an MP when she was killed, but you know, I always describe her first and foremost as a humanitarian. She genuinely cared about other people. She really wanted to make a difference to other people's lives. And she'd worked in various countries all around the world, war zones and, and areas of, of real poverty where people often had very little food or water and, and sadly very little hope. And the reason she came back to the UK was to start her family, uh, but also to make a difference um, in the community where we grew up. Um, because Jo really was a, a proud Yorkshire lass and, and she loved she loved this area where I still live, where mum and dad still live. Um, and her, but her motivation for the work was the same. She wasn't a tribal politician. She wanted to work on issues that mattered to people. Um, if I think about our childhood, which I have done a lot over the, the past few years, we were blessed with two amazing parents who really instilled in us a core set of values and beliefs and, you know, Nothing, you know, majorly, majorly, you know, rocket science, but just things like about how you treat other people and treating other people how you would wish to be treated and thinking before you speak and trying to understand different people's perspectives and, and things like that, which, to be honest, I always took for granted. Um, and now I see actually now how important some of those really simple principles are. Um, sadly, our childhood was also um, filled with matching outfits and dreadful haircuts, which you can see there. So anybody who is a similar age to me may well have gone for that lovely basin number that we can see, uh, which has um, plagued me ever since. Um, but yeah, so that kind of get, but we were really just a normal family with bad haircuts, but we were really just a, what you would, I mean, you always think you're normal, don't you, compared to everybody else, but we, we you know, we didn't, there was nothing majorly significant about us other than, like I say, now thinking back these values and beliefs that we just picked up and saw through through how we were brought up and um, so that's a little bit a little bit about Joe in terms of what I'm going to focus on today I'm going to talk about three things primarily uh, one is the Joe Cox Foundation which is the charity that we set up after Joe was killed the second is the more in common community and network and the third is the great get-together and, and those three things, I am going to, as has been said, look at these things through the lens of loneliness and social isolation, but not just that, because I don't think you can look at the work that we do just through 
one issue because what we do so much of the community work that we do is about a broader set of issues and they're all interlinked and they all overlap um, and I'd be interested to know sort of your thoughts on that um, certainly where we live locally um, loneliness and isolation plays itself out in different ways and that's something I think we need to we need to think about um, so in terms of the Joe Cox Foundation um, when something so horrific happens, there's there's nothing anybody can do to, to make it better. Um, but what tends to happen, as we've seen on many occasions, is people will set up a fund and people will donate money. And I think part of that is because there's no, there's nothing else they can do. So we set up a fund in Joe's name and we raised a huge amount of money. And what we did with that money at the time, we said, right, let's pick some causes that Joe cared about. And um, so we picked three causes. We, and we gave the money to those three charities. So the White Helmets in Syria, who are basically a civilian army who work in war-torn um, Syria, essentially pulling people out of bombed buildings. Um, and Joe spent time in Syria and, and felt passionately about the, the issues that the country faces. So we, we donated money towards the White Helmets. We bought an ambulance, which has got Joe's name on it, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and then the second organisation um, was Hope Not Hate, which some of you may have heard of. And Hope Not Hate are a fantastic organisation who look at extremism, the causes of extremism and how it manifests itself. And they do a lot of research. Um, and we did that because of the nature of, of how Joe was killed. Um, and we do have to be aware that there is a worrying rise in right wing extremism in this country. And sadly, as we have seen um, only over the last 24 hours, we've got issues around Islamist extremism. And, and I think work into, into that subject is really important. And, um, and so Hope Not Hate was another beneficiary. And then at a local level, we gave money to the Royal Voluntary Service, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, who work particularly on loneliness and social isolation among older people. Um, and across Kirklees, the area where we live, we gave them money. And they've done some amazing work in the last four years with the money that we provided them with. So that's what we did with most of the money. And then we were sort of, OK, we've got some money left. What are we going to do with it? And we said, well, why don't we set up a foundation in Joe's name? And why don't we use that foundation to tackle some of the issues that Joe was working on? And I guess, you know, finish some of that business for Joe. And so we set the foundation up. But as you can imagine, at this time, none of this was done with a plan, with a structure. You know, everything was still hugely, hugely emotional for us. Um, and it took us a good couple of years really to think about a, a clear vision and a mission for the, for the organization. Um, so I, I've got that on the screen there, but, but really I suppose the overriding aim of the foundation is, is trying to build a kinder, more compassionate society where everybody has a sense of belonging and a sense of identity. And we recognize that we've got more in common than that which divides us. So the things that bind us together as human beings, we focus on those things rather than spending all our time thinking about the things that we disagree on and the things that tend to divide us. And, and just to be clear, that doesn't mean that we agree on everything. It doesn't mean that we're all the same. Of course we're not. And the world would be a very boring place if we were. But what it means is sometimes we need to come back from our differences and think about the connections that bind us together as human beings. So that's kind of the, the fundamental basis for the foundation. And we work um, at three levels, locally, nationally and internationally, which I'll talk about in a second. And a lot of what we do is, is partnership work. So it's working with, with organisations who share our vision and share the values that we hold in terms of trying to build this fairer, kinder, more compassionate society that Jo dedicated her life to building. So I'll go through those three strands. Locally, um, we work here in West Yorkshire. Um, and when I say locally, we've got a good, um, a really good provision sort of here in West Yorkshire, but actually we then spread that out across the whole country as well. So we've got a more in common community, which is a, um, a network of different groups across the whole country. But really the heart of that is here in Batley and Spen. And I'll talk about the more in common community and network in, in due course. But again, this is about building that sense of community where we pull everyone together. Uh, we give everybody that sense of identity and belonging. And one of the main channels that we use to do that is the Great Get Together, the campaign which we do on what would have been Joe's birthday. And again, I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. Nationally, various strands to our, our sort of what we call national work. Um, you'll remember probably all too well, particularly any of you who are quite directly involved in politics, the level of toxicity that was around in 2016 in terms of the abuse that 
um, MPs were facing, the abuse that sadly probably some of you were facing, um, because primarily around Brexit. Um, and there was a real horribleness about politics. And sadly, I think we have to be honest, that there was also a, a real nastiness around the way that some MPs and politicians were behaving as well. And one of the things that we've tried to do is, is, is work towards building a better public discourse, a better public life, tackling the abuse and intimidation uh, that people who put themselves in public life uh, face. And actually this goes broader, doesn't it? We can talk about celebrities, we can talk about journalists, we can talk about the police. You know, there is a real, um, yeah, nastiness about how we treat people who choose to put themselves in, in public positions. So we're, we're doing work on that and we've been doing work on that for the past couple of years. We're devising a standard of conduct that we're asking all the political parties to sign up to and we're making some really good progress on that, but but it is, it's ongoing um, clearly because lots of other things have been happening. Um, but that's really important to us. And, and again, this is not about agreeing on everything. Absolutely not. You know, I'm really clear. Joe would have been the first person to advocate, advocate robust, passionate debate. And as am I, you know, it's really important that we talk about serious issues and we, and, and we have conversations with people who we disagree with profoundly to try and understand each other. But there's a way of doing that that doesn't descend into personal attacks and insults and, and you know, worst case scenario, physical violence. So that, that's a, a piece of our work that we're very proud to be working on. Also, a big thing for me is working on a cross party basis. Joe was really keen to do this. Let's find the issue. Let's find whoever um, is going to make a change on this issue and let's work together. And loneliness is a really good example of where Joe did that. And I will, I will talk about that. And we carried that on after she was killed. Also keen to get the next generation of women and young people putting themselves forward into public life, um, as tough as that may be. Um, so we do work on that. And then one thing that we set up um, this year because of, of lockdown and the pandemic is something called the Connection Coalition, which, again, I will come back on to um, shortly. So that's kind of a, an overview of some of the national stuff that we do. We're only a small team at the Joe Cox Foundation. We are like Joe. We are small but mighty. So I'm talking about international work, but we don't deliver anything internationally because there's, there's just not enough of us. Um, at, but we were delighted a couple of years ago when the Department for International Development launched the Joe Cox Memorial Grants. Um, and this was a series of grants that are now taking place. I think it's about 18 different countries around the world. And there were two themes to those grants. One was looking at vulnerable communities who were susceptible to breakdown and violence and division. And the second was looking at female empowerment. So we gave these grants out to some amazing organisations doing things all over the place, um, you know, whether it's Iraq, Uganda, Kenya, you know, literally countries all over the world. So that's our kind of international support role. So those are the three strands to our work. And if you want to see more about that, go on the foundation's website there's loads of information on there uh, and please feel free to do so and um, i'm going to come on now to talk about loneliness is it a, an opportune moment to see if there are any burning questions or shall i just crack on happy for me to carry on i'm getting that vibe so yeah yeah carry on and, and we can take questions at the end and i'll explain to every, we either you or i can explain to everybody how they can ask questions if they want to raise their hands so brilliant yeah lovely lovely right i will continue so loneliness i've, I've talked a little bit already about about loneliness but here's really the story of, of how we've worked on loneliness and isolation and, and essentially this does come from joe and it was an issue that joe sort of came across really when she was campaigning and she'd find herself going out knocking on doors again as I'm sure lots of you have done going out knocking on doors people coming to surgeries to see her when she was campaigning to the MP and, and and then when she when she was the MP visiting care homes residential homes and and really finding a lot of the time people just wanted to chat um and they just wanted to have a conversation they just wanted to spend a bit of time with somebody who were, who was prepared to listen and Joe was a very good listener um and you know a bit like me once you get chatting to someone you know, she would literally have to be dragged out of meetings and things to get away, which is what I'm like uh, at the moment. And, and she just thought, you know, there's something going on here. You know, pe people are struggling. People are feeling like they're on their own. So she started meeting with local groups and organisations and then some national charities and looked into the issue of, of loneliness and isolation a bit more. And she realised, actually, this is this is a, a serious problem. So she found some statistics around it and, and did a bit of research. And she found, again, 
But we naturally talk about older people feeling lonely. And indeed, the statistics do support that there is an issue with loneliness and isolation amongst, amongst older people. Um, but this only really scratches the surface. Um, lots of other groups are vulnerable to feeling lonely and isolated. You know, and again, so much of this obviously now resonates with everything the country's going through at the moment. But young men, suicide in young men, and this is going back when Joe did the research about five years ago, was the highest it had ever been. I dread to think what the statistics are now, but we know from working with people like Mind that this is a huge problem. I mean, it's brilliant to see some of the work that's been done by organisations like Andy's Man's Club and, and, and some of the other organisations that are specifically working with men in this area. But that is really, really worrying. Young mums and indeed young dads, you know, you become a parent for the first time and suddenly it's just you and the baby. It can be a very lonely place to be. Retirement, you've had this network all your life, you've worked all your life, suddenly it's gone. Bereavement, clearly, when we lose someone we love, it's a very lonely place to be. And I always think in terms of bereavement, particularly with older people, if you've been married to somebody for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years, um, like my mum and dad have, I think it would actually be really weird if you weren't lonely, if you lost that person. Um, and carers, you know, if you're caring for somebody and that is the only person you see, and again, particularly during lockdown, goodness me, it can be a really, really isolated place to be. Now, I'm not going to talk about the theoretical side of loneliness too much because a lot of that has been done and, and a lot of that has been done through some of the work that we've done. Um, but, but the other thing I think to add is the fact that Joe also had a bit of an affinity with the issue of loneliness because she'd been there herself. I talked a bit about our childhood uh, and when we were growing up we were pretty much inseparable. We did everything together whether it was guides or BMX bikes or uh, fame dancing you know we did everything together and then when we got to um well when joe got to 18 and went away to university and she went to cambridge anybody on the call from cambridge i'm sure there may be um and she went to cambridge university which was amazing i mean she was the first you know person in our family to go to to university full stop never mind cambridge but it was a very very different world and for a, a yorkshire lass you know working class background it, you know, it was a very lonely place to be, if I'm honest. And we're going back now again, prior to mobile phones, prior to emails, all that sort of stuff. Um, and Joe really struggled. Similarly, I was up here in Yorkshire on my own without my best mate, and I was extremely lonely. So that was a really tough time for us. And again, I, I, I didn't mention it on the previous slide, but, you know, students going away to university, some of you might have children or grandchildren who have gone away to university this time. And, you know, gosh, how hard is that this year? So and, and then Joe, as, as a new mum as well, you know, again, you have you have suddenly got this new human being in your life and it's just you and them. And that can feel extremely isolating. Um, and again, obviously, bereavement, which, you know, I can certainly say that I've had some lonely moments during the last few years. Um, so what Joe thought was, right, this is an issue. I'm going to do something about it. Who can I work with? She reached out across the benches in the House of Commons and she found um, Seema Kennedy, who is an MP on the Conservative benches, and they started working together on this national cross-party coalition. And again, I think loneliness is a really good example of Joe's desire to work on the human issues that people were facing um, and cut through the party politics to do so. Uh, when Joe was killed, Seema did a wonderful job of uh, approaching Rachel Reeves, who was a, a good friend of Joe's on the Labour benches, and saying, look, me and Joe have started this work. We can't just let it go. Will you come and work with me? Um, Rachel tells the story very, very well. Before she knew it, Rachel was suddenly signed up and, and, and active in this, this, this coalition um, working on loneliness. And loads and loads of hard work went into it. Again, one thing I'm really clear about on, on, on most issues is there's probably already some amazing organisations and amazing people doing good, good work. So let's not reinvent the wheel. So what the commission did, the Joe Cox Commission, found all those organisations, pulled them all together. And our ex-CEO, Iona Lawrence, who I think some of you might have met, who is amazing, you know, she, she pulled this coalition together, got everybody talking to each other, everybody working together. And because of that joint up collaborative work, we ended up with a report being launched in December 2017, which the, the girls came up to Batley and did. It was like Charlie's Angels on that day. I was like, that oh, sat in between these two amazing politicians thinking, what the heck am I doing here yet again? But it was brilliant. Uh, we launched the report. And then in 2018, we had a reception at Downing Street. Um, I'm trying to stay out of party politics today, but we were with Theresa May in Downing Street. Um, quite socially awkward. Theresa, not me. Um, and, but it was good. It was a good, good day. 
Um, but I just can't cope with silence. So it was all a bit awkward. I'm like, just, so how's it going? Bear in mind, this is in the middle of Brexit. She was like, hmm, not that well, actually. Came. <laughs> anyway, but it was a really good event. Um, and, you know, it got loneliness on the map as an issue. And it's like anything, isn't it? As soon as you start talking about it, you're halfway there to doing something about it. We ended up with the world's first ever Minister for Loneliness, Tracy Crouch, who had did a brilliant job, absolutely brilliant job. Um, and has, that job has now been done by a couple of other people since. 2018, we launched the world's ever strategy on loneliness. Um, absolutely brilliant. And then in 2019, we... Um, it was by Baroness Diana Barron who was appointed to lead the government's work on loneliness and we've got a very good close working relationship with her. January this year they launched their first report so all this stuff is available it's in the public domain if this is an area you feel passionate about please do have, have a look at some of this stuff. So that's kind of a, a, a bit of potted history of, of how the Joe Cox Foundation has continued the work that Joe started on loneliness. And I think what's the biggest bit of progress for me, like I say there, is the fact that we've started talking about it a lot more. We've started acknowledging it's something that we can probably all going to experience at some point in our lives. We've started, you know, breaking down the taboo, breaking down the stigma. And I think that that is really important progress. And also connecting the many amazing organisations and people who are working on this issue in communities up and down the country. So that that's kind of our story there. Um, and again, I'm not going to spend huge amounts of time on this because I think you've probably been spoken to by other people who talk about these things, but it kind of fits in with the broader work, like I've said before, that we do about stronger communities. And, and the theoretical side of this is looking at how our communities have changed. And when I think back to our childhood, we always talk about my granddad, who Joe and I loved dearly. And, and granddad had worked for the post office for years. He was a postman, then he became a postmaster, and he knew everybody in the local town. Like you could not go shopping with granddad because it took forever because every single person wanted to speak to him and chat to him because the only way was. And, and, and those connections that I think, I mean, I remember that from childhood, you know, and, and also before supermarkets. So you literally went into the butchers and the bakers and, you know, and the news agents and you went to individual shops to buy everything that you needed. And so, so much more human interaction than we've got now. Um, and also other things, you know, which I will just touch on briefly. I also remember my grandma and granddad used to walk everywhere. So you came across people, you weren't sat in your car all day, not interacting with other people. Um, and there's other issues around that from a physical activity perspective as well, but also the social benefits of, of not being out in your community. Technology clearly has got a massive part to play. Technology for me is always a double-edged sword. It's amazing. How amazing is this that we're able to do this today? It's brilliant, I love it. But I'd much rather be in a room with you chatting and having eye contact and and seeing body language and maybe having a little cuddle you know those things you know and and you know technology has taken a lot of that stuff away from us and again the pace of life I mean I am the worst person in the world for this always in a rush and I really sometimes have to just press pause and say hang on a minute Kim just enjoy this moment instead of thinking of the next five things that you should be doing just press pause and be in the moment and I need to really work on that and I think probably lots of us do. So because of these reasons and lots of others as well we've had communities which have changed you know dramatically in, in how they work and how they operate and what that can mean is that a lot of us lack a sense of belonging, lack a sense of identity and you know one of the outcomes of that is this sense of loneliness and this sense of isolation. And again, looking at different areas of the country, I'm thinking about the area where lots of you are, you know, in rural communities, this can be exacerbated hugely if you are physically further apart from other people as well. But also, again, thinking more holistically, you know, the things that I've described there are not just going to feed into loneliness and isolation, but they're going to look, we're going to think about issues around mental health as well. Um, and also, you know, the more sinister side of this is people who may be drawn towards extremism. There has been a worrying rise um, during lockdown of young men in particular looking online at extremist materials, you know, and again, that is as a result of being isolated. It's a result of being being on their own. So we need to look at this issue, I think, I think broader. And obviously, as I've sort of said already, you know, the last eight months or so, we've got a global pandemic on top of all these existing issues. So loneliness really has hit hard for so many people and so many people who might have never felt lonely before. You know, I've got, I've got mates who live on their own out of choice. They're quite happy living on their own, but they don't spend a lot of time at home on their own. They're always out and about doing stuff. 
but suddenly all that was taken away and suddenly they are at home on their own. Um, so new people experiencing loneliness and isolation. I'm going to pause for breath, which I don't do very often. <laughs> um, again, just any, any quick questions coming up or shall I, I will carry on my next bit, but unless there's anything particularly to talk about. I'm taking that as a no, which means either you're all mesmerized or you've nodded off. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to go with the former. Um, okay. So next thing to think about. So we talked a bit about loneliness. We've talked about the fact that it has been acknowledged as an issue and as an important issue for lots of people, you know, Joe and I, both of us, right. What we're going to do about it. We can sit around here all night talking about what a big problem it is now, how sad it is now, how horrible it is, or actually we can start to think about some solutions. So a couple of things that we've done in the past few years. I'll talk about the More in Common community, the More in Common network. And for anybody that doesn't know, More in Common is an expression that was taken from Joe's maiden speech in Parliament. And what Joe observed, we live in a very diverse area in Batley and Spen and, and in, indeed across West Yorkshire. Lots of differences, lots of people from different backgrounds. But what Joe observed was knocking on doors and speaking to people she found that we are actually far more united and are far more in common than that which divides us. And again, as I said earlier, this doesn't mean that we're all the same. It doesn't mean that we all agree. But what Joe found, and again, you'll have experience of this, particularly people who you know work with the public a lot, which many of you do, you know, people will come to you with a lot of the same issues. People want to feed the kids. They want to go to work. They want to pay the bills. They want to see the friends and generally want to live peacefully and harmoniously in their communities together. So some of these things that just cut through the differences and cut through the division, I think are the things that we should spend a bit more time on. And that was certainly what Joe observed. Now, after Joe was killed, um, what often happens, and we've seen it recently again, is in a crisis, people show the best of humanity. And, and at a local level, so many people reached out to me and mum and dad and and said right we, we're going to help we're going to help you as a family but actually we're going to help this community and we're not going to allow Joe's murder to divide us and there was a real tangible sense if I'm honest that that, that could have happened but it didn't because people went no we're not doing that so people pulled together and we ended up with this amazing volunteer group who we now call more in common Batley and Spen organizing events putting things on pulling people together initially in grief but then actually coming out of that into doing some really positive things. What I didn't know at the time was, as well as in West Yorkshire, that was happening in other places across the country. So what we've got now is this more in common community, more in common network, which I describe as a national grassroots movement, working towards building these strong, compassionate communities, developing this sense of belonging and identity for people. Um, and these groups are now springing up and we are now encouraging them to spring up. And this might be something that, that people want to take away from today. Um, and again, you know, there's a guy in Darlington set a group up after Joe was killed. And he, he just couldn't believe that that could happen in our country, you know, along with lots of other things that were going on at the time and, and the division that, that, that was taking place. And he set a group up and he actually initially called themselves the White Rose in Darlington after Joe and, and, and we found him probably about 18 months later and they became a more in common group because they really believe in the values and the aims and objectives that, that we've set up through the more in common network. In Lambeth in London and Boston in Lincolnshire groups were set up, more in common groups were set up and this is one of my favourite stories, Lambeth had the highest remain vote in the EU referendum, Boston had the highest leave vote in the EU referendum and instead of viewing each other as sworn enemies who would never darken each other's doorsteps, they actually reached out to each other to try and understand why that had happened, to think, okay, what's going on in your community that's made people think that way? And what's going on in your community that's made people think that way? And they started organizing visits to each other and some really powerful friendships have been formed and a real sense of understanding of how things are different in different towns and cities and villages was gained. So that's a really powerful story. We've got a, a group in Birmingham now set up and, and, and these groups, like I say, are developing across, across the area. And, and really, you know, again, it's nothing too complicated. It's just about counteracting the divisions and the, the narrative around, you know, the fact that none of us, we can't get along, you know, we, we disagree on everything and, and those sorts of things. And looking at community issues within that and loneliness certainly is part of that as well. 
that really, if I'm honest, just normal people who want to make a difference and do something positive, very, very simply. And I think one of the things to capitalise on now in terms of this more in common network is uh, the mutual aid groups that have popped up. So again, if you've got any groups in your area that have popped up to help with the, the COVID crisis, what we found is a lot of them are now looking for a pathway, looking for what they do next. I mean, sadly, at the moment, they'll be getting us through the next lockdown. But what they do as a result of that, because we've got people who've been mobilised, who want to do something, don't necessarily want to engage in party politics, but want to do something to help their communities. And that could be a more in common group. So that might be something that you want to know more about. And what I say about the more in common groups are it's not party political, but equally you can be politically active and be part of a more in common group. So we've got quite a few people who knew Joe through the Labour Party who were obviously part of the more in common group. But equally, we've got people from other political persuasions and I guess primarily lots of people who, who are not politically active who want to do something at a local level. So that's kind of the more in common community. How that manifests itself locally in Batley and Spend, three main things that we do. Community-based events, and I'll talk about the great get-together in due course. Events that bring people together. Events that transcend differences and just get people having good fun. Partnerships and networking. And this is something I personally feel really strongly about, and this is probably partly because of my background. So I worked in the private sector, then the public sector, and then found myself um, in the voluntary sector. Um, and I've seen really good strengths of all three sectors, and I've seen some frustrations of all sectors. And I think the only way to really achieve meaningful change is to pull out the strengths of all three sectors and work together. Um, the first few meetings we had, the first few more in common meetings we had, there was a lot of council bashing. Now I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this. So there's a lot of sitting round rooms, people going, well, the council should be doing this and the council should be doing that. And I was like, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. We can sit here for two hours and moan about what the council should or shouldn't be doing. Or we can actually say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to try and make a difference and to try and make a change? And then what we can do, we can go chat to the council and say, we've had this good idea. We're thinking about doing this. Would it fit with what you're doing? Shall we do it together? And shall we find a local business who's prepared to chuck a bit of money into it? And it was, and honestly, it was almost like there was a, oh, yeah, we could do that. And I was like, well, it's up to you, but I don't want to sit here moaning because I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to waste my time. The time we've got is too precious. So let's take this, this different approach. And, we've, and since we've done that, it, it's amazing. We've got a really positive, powerful relationship with Kirklees Council. Um, you know, and, I, and there's some really good people who work for the council. But sadly, they can't often act as swiftly as they would like because they do have to go through procedures and they do have to sign forms and they do have to do all that stuff. Um, now, the voluntary sector often doesn't have to do all that stuff. And again, with COVID, I don't know what it's like where you guys are, but the voluntary sector just mobilised and just went bonkers. So like, right, people need help. Let's go help them. Oh, what about doing a risk assessment? No, 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 we're not doing a risk assessment. What about filling up? What about asking the managers? No, we're not doing any of that. We're just going to get food to people. Um, and that's what happened. So then what happened was uh, locally, certainly for us, is we now work really closely with the council who do their really important stuff. The voluntary set to do their really important stuff. We've had some funding from local businesses. And together, we've managed to meet the local demands of people who are really struggling. And that for me is just, you know, it's actually really simple, isn't it? But it doesn't always happen. So that's my little rant on that. Um, OK, and then the third bit is community projects. Um, and I guess this is what, you know, I sort of call the tough stuff. It's all very well preaching to the converted. It's all very well everyone who thinks that everyone should be treated equally and live together peacefully, coming together and having a nice time and having some cake together. But actually, how do we reach the people who don't naturally embrace that more in common philosophy? You know, and this is still a work in progress for us. It's hard. You know, there are divisions where we live. There are issues in our communities. And I would never shy away from that fact. But it's hard to develop a plan to really pull people in and engage them. So we're doing some work on that at the minute. Um, and it's such a shame, again, like lockdown has prevented so many things happening in real life. But we're doing some online discussion groups, getting people to share their experiences of what they've been through. Because um, I think that's huge, isn't it? You know, you can't develop empathy if you don't meet people who've 
you know gone through different situations to you and had different experiences to you so that 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 is a challenging one and obviously those things are all interlinked so the events you know we work together in partnership to put events together we might do a project within an event or a project might come out of an event you know so all that work is sort of interlinked together um okay I'm not going to read through these, but if anybody is interested in, in finding more about the more in common groups, it took us a lot of meetings, but eventually we came up with values and aims and objectives. Um, I'm sure you've all sat in those meetings. Um, and, and it was hard because so much of what we did initially was done organically. It was done on passion, enthusiasm and emotion. But we came up with our objectives and our aims and, and, and they're there. If anybody is interested, I can share those with you afterwards. In, in terms of how we operate, I think this was another thing for me to sort of focus on was, right, what are we actually going to do? So we've got all these ideas and these aims and objectives, but how are we going to use these to bring people together? Um, and again, nothing too fancy about this. My background, obviously, in sport and physical activity meant that I felt really passionately about the power of physical activity to bring people together. When you are running a race, kicking a ball, dancing around, the differences don't matter to the because you've got that shared activation, you've got that synchronization, and you've got that shared objective and goal. So using sport and physical activity to bring people together, I think is really important. Education, really clear, you know, if we are gonna make meaningful long-term change, we have to engage with young people, we have to work with children. So we have very good relationships with all the local primary schools and all the local secondary schools. And we try and do events where we bring children from different backgrounds together. Faith and culture, Again, depending on where you are in the country, could be more or less of an issue. Where we live, we have a very big Muslim community and a non-Muslim community. We've got um, a lot of Irish Catholic heritage. And it's how do we bring those different faiths and cultures together to understand each other? Not necessarily agree, but understand each other, educate each other about why they behave in certain ways. Um, so faith and culture forms an important part of what we do. And then the last one, which is my definitely weakest area, the creative arts. Um, but fortunately, I've got an amazing team who can sing and can make things and can, you know, make well whatever you want. They can do it, basically. But I'm rubbish at that stuff. So it's really important that I've got that team. But again, you know, if you are part of a knit and natter group, sometimes the differences don't matter, do they? You're just going to get together, knit something lovely and have a good old chat together. So again, none of that is, you know, I'm not saying that this is revolutionary because it's clearly not, is it? But it's just putting something a structure around some of the stuff that we've been doing and I'm really pleased on our on our board in our group we've got because this is the thing that I love about more income and battling in Spain is we genuinely represent the community so we've got older people younger people Muslims non-Muslims um, we've got you know people who are politically affiliated people who are not politically affiliated you know range of different backgrounds really you know really diverse so we've got imam vicar head teachers so that, that's the good thing about it. It really does represent the area. Okay, right. My third thing. Gosh, is that only three? It's like that. It feels like 300. Hmm. So, the great get together. Now, some of you, I'm not going to ask because it's embarrassing if nobody has heard of it, but I'm sure some of you will have heard of the great get together. Um, and we set the great get together up um, because we had to make a decision as to what we did on the anniversary of Joe's murder. And, um, you know, I always say that I wouldn't blame anyone for shutting up shop and closing the curtains and locking the doors and not doing anything, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to do something very positive and we wanted to do something very Joe. And we really wanted to focus on how Joe lived rather than on how she died. So across that weekend, we said, right, let's try and encourage the country to have a really big party. Let's try and encourage the country to show the best of Britain and what people are really about because just because our lives have been torn apart by one individual who didn't live that way we're actually going to focus on the many millions of people who do care about other people and do want to bring people together and unite communities and that's what the great get together was about so we said to people do whatever you want just bring people together it can be a big event it can be a small event it can be in your block of flats or your cul-de-sac or it can be in the town square whatever do something it can be based around food it can be based around music it can be based around sport it really doesn't matter put something on and i guess in a nutshell people went a bit bonkers for it and people organized stuff all over the country in their communities towns villages cities and um, and I think what that really showed me, and again, obviously at this stage, I'm still pretty numb and, and, and brand new to this sort of stuff, was sometimes people just need a platform. And actually sometimes 
we don't know where to start and this resonates with the issue of loneliness we don't know how to reach out or we're nervous or we're embarrassed or we're shy and actually once there's a platform put in front of us to enable these connections to take place we're actually very good at it and we actually do it very naturally um, and you know we see it other examples is like the jubilee the queen's jubilee the olympics you know in yorkshire we have the tour de yorkshire so the tour de yorkshire is this big cycling event People line the streets, they're out there in their thousands, right? I went, we went in 2017 because they rerouted it in honor of Joe, which was lovely, right? The cyclists are gone past in five seconds. Zoom. So that is not about the cycling, is it? That is not about the cycling. That is about what is going on around the cycling. It's about the cakes and the parties and the chatting and the bunting and the celebrations. Don't get me wrong, the cycling's blooming amazing, but for so many people, it's not about that. It's about that sense of community. And the Olympics, again, was a really good example of this. You know, really, really uh, powerful people coming together. So I guess that was kind of what we tried to do with the Great Get Together. And, it, and you know, it, it did go extremely well. So we've done it every year since. We moved it um, onto what would have been Joe's birthday, which is the 22nd of June, the week after. Um, and again, you know, people have just really embraced it. And, and I think, what I'll, again, what I love about it is it's not very prescriptive. So you can do whatever you want with it. We've had cricket tournaments. We've had singing. We've had we do a little event locally in Batley Town Centre called Cakes on the Cobbles. And it literally is just about people coming together, passing trade who might just be wanting to sit down and have a cup of tea and a piece of cake together. Um, I'll talk a little bit. I am conscious of time. I'm conscious that I'm doing way too much talking. I'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've done within it. Because again, what I'd rather give you is ideas that you can take away. That's the main thing, you know, for me in terms of today is, is what you can maybe do. Now, obviously, all this is pre-lockdown. And I will talk about how we responded to lockdown because I think there's some good learnings there as well. Um, but stuff that we did, right, running. Jo was, a, was a, a keen runner when she got chance after having two kids and stuff. But she, um, so a couple of women who knew Joe said, right, let's organise a run in Joe's name. So we set up the run for Joe in the local country park. Um, a thousand people running through the woods. You know, again, that sense of togetherness, that sense of, you know, community. We put some live music on. We got a huge amount of support from local businesses and stuff. Um, and the run for Joe has been an epic event. Now, again, this is a really good example of focusing on what you can do rather than what you can't do which I suppose is one of my key messages today this year obviously we couldn't do the run but what I love about you know the Joe Cox Foundation team and, and so many people that I am fortunate to have in my life is we're not going to be beaten we're not going to be defeated we're not going to cancel we don't do cancelling goodness me no we find a way to make it work so we put the run for Joe as a virtual run and we said to people, look, still do your run. Just do it wherever you are in the world. Send us your pictures. Send us what you're doing. And we had people running in 35 different countries around the world. Bear in mind, this is just a little local event that's set up in a local country park. I think it just shows you the power of, you know, positive leadership. You know, people saying, no, actually, we can do this and we are going to do it. And it was really, really, yeah, wonderful. Um, and hopefully what we're going to do next year, we'll do the run in real life, but we'll also do the virtual version as well. So it'll be even even bigger and better. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Um, OK, the Iftar. This is a big event for me. So 2017, I didn't know what an Iftar was. But what I did know was the first great get together took place during Ramadan. So that meant half the community couldn't eat any of the cake. Now, at this point, like I said, I didn't know much, but I knew that that was wrong. So I said, right, well, what can we do? So then my Muslim friends said to me, well, during Ramadan, when the sun goes down, we break the fast and we have what's called an iftar. And that is the meal that we have. I'm guessing lots of you know this, but, but I didn't at the time. So I said, right, then we're going to do an iftar. So sat down again. You've probably all been in these meetings. A lot of negativity. A lot of people won't come. Muslim community won't come, the white community won't come, the women won't come. Well, no one's going to bring the kids. It's a lot of negativity. So I did my usual annoying, well, we're doing it, so let's crack on and get it organised and see what happens. Um, and we catered optimistically for 250 people and a 1,000 people descended on Batley Town Centre. And it was one of the most beautiful, spiritual, yeah, moving occasions I've ever been privileged enough to be involved with. And again, it just showed you that people wanted that people wanted that sense of coming together 
Um, and it was an educational piece as well. It was finding out about what Ramadan is and why do people do it? And, you know, so it, it, yeah, really, really powerful. We ran out of food. So the guy from the local Italian restaurant was running down the steps with huge vats of pasta trying to feed people. And there was just this, like I say, this real sense of, of, of people coming together. Um, other things that we do, we've got a really good relationship with the local rugby league team. Um, rugby league you might have heard of it it's quite big up here in the north um, and we work really closely with Batley Bulldogs which is our local rugby league team and so we said to them Joe had worked with them and they loved Joe and we said right let's put a memorial game on we'll raise some money if you guys can raise some money so we put it on for free and we got the biggest crowd they've ever had uh, we put live music on and again just this real community sense of togetherness um, and again, getting people to meet people from different backgrounds, getting people to come out who might not normally come out, breaking down the financial barriers because we made it free. Uh, so that that really, really powerful event as well. Um, and I talked about education a little bit. So we do an event with 23 different schools across the area. And one of the issues, I think, again, that can, can breed division and, and um is people not meeting people from from who are different to themselves people not meeting people from different backgrounds and that has to start with young people it has to start with children so we work with the local um, trust of schools 23 schools we said right we're going to do a parade through batley town center we got all this we got sponsorship of t-shirts so every school has its own colored t-shirt we call it step into the future we got the kids to all make big banners and signs saying more in common and they parade through the town centre led by this amazing samba band. We walked them up to the, the rugby ground again and we got them all doing different workshops together um, and meeting people who were not like them. So a really, really powerful event, Step Into the Future. Um, what else? Oh, so a lot of that was great get together stuff. Another event that we do, which falls outside the great get together weekend is the Joe Cox Way Bike Ride. And again, this was set up by a chap who had never met Joe, but was so devastated in 2016, he wanted to do something. So he set up a bike ride in her name and him and his friends cycled from North Yorkshire to London over four and a half days. And they called it the Joe Cox Way Bike Ride. I found out about this guy and I said, gosh, this is amazing. It's really, really interesting. And, and we started working together and Safraz, who's in the picture there with the yellow helmet on, and I became friends and they persuaded me to do the ride in 2018. It was bloody horrible, but I did it. Um, and it was really powerful. I mean, physically, it was really hard, I have to be honest, but it was really powerful. The sense of togetherness among the cyclists, the eldest was 72, the youngest was 14 people from all different backgrounds and stuff. And it was a hugely moving event. We ended up in London with some friends that we know on Bankside where they do a big, great get together event. They welcomed us. We raised some money for the foundation and yeah, really, really, really powerful. And again, in terms of flipping things this year, sadly we waited as long as we could. And then we eventually we accepted that we had to cancel the bike ride, but we threw it online. We set up a website and we said to people still do some miles. And we set ourselves the goal of cycling the circumference of the world, which is 25,000 miles. And we were all really nervous, thinking, oh, what if we don't do it? And actually, again, people just embraced it. People, as people did during lockdown, got on their bikes. Some people cycled 200 miles, some people cycled two miles, but it all added up. And we smashed the target and we cycled 30,000 miles. And, it, you know, just absolutely amazing that, that, that people did that. Um, okay. The last that I'm going to talk about is our response to COVID and to lockdown. Again, happy for me to just carry on. Yep, I'm getting a few little nods there. Brilliant. Yep. Um, I know I'm chucking a load of information at you, which is a real weakness of mine, but uh, I'm just hoping even if there's something you can take from some of it that you can say, actually, we could do that at work or actually I could do that in my in my street or whatever, then hopefully that, that's worthwhile. Um, if we think back to March, um, which we probably don't want to but if we think back to march there was that period where and you'll you'll you will all remember it i'm sure where there were lots of people on telly lots of men in suits generally telling us what we couldn't do do not do this stay at home don't go see anybody um, and what we felt as a foundation was there was a real lack of human sort of understanding about the impact this was going to have on people's lives there was not enough acknowledgement of what this was going to mean to people in terms of the things that they were going to lose and the connections that they were going to be forced to lose so we said hang on a minute everything is on about what you can't do 
why we need to flip this narrative a little bit and try and encourage people to think about the things they can do and how they can stay connected during this challenging time. And actually, it, it was Iona again who, who said, right, what about setting up a coalition of organisations who are working on some of these human issues around lockdown? So we set up something called the Connection Coalition. We've got a website which I would, I would advise you to have, to have a look at if you haven't seen it before. And again, it's working on a cross sector basis. Organisations, charities, companies and different groups who were determined to enable people to stay connected during lockdown. Again, goes back to this idea of building community. Obviously, building community is much harder under the circumstances that we're under now, but it's not impossible. And I think we have to find ways to do it rather than give up on it. So we set the, the coalition up with big organisations, the Red Cross, MIND, um, Facebook gave us some funding, Nesta gave us some funding. I think there are about six organisations in total. And we just said to people, sign up, join us. And join, didn't you, the, the, um, with your organisation. And we've now got over 600 organisations signed up. And it just showed us that there was this real demand for organisations to come together and focus on some of this stuff. And I guess the three main things that we focus are on loneliness and isolation, mental health and well-being, and grief and bereavement. Because for, for us, those were the very three human issues that so many people have been and still are affected by during lockdown. And the, the, it got better as time went on in terms of news uh, channels and papers covering positive stories. But initially, there wasn't much of that. It was all very, very heavy on all the stuff we couldn't do. And I'm glad that it has got a lot better. Um, so that's the Connection Coalition. So again, I'm really proud of the way that, that Joe's foundation acted as Joe would and went, right, let's not do a long list of everything we can't do. Let's do a list of the things that we can do. And sadly, it's a lot shorter, but it's still worth doing. And let's focus on that. And that, that's what we did with the Connection Coalition. Um, great get together again. I've, I've mentioned a few of these bits already. It would have been very easy in March or April or May to cancel the great get together. And I really dug in on this and said, no, we're not going to do that. I said, actually, this year it's going to be needed more than ever. Let's just find a way to make it work. And, and that's what we did. So we threw a lot of stuff online, as, as loads of us have done. Um, I talked about the run that we got people doing all over the world. Um, a couple of my amazing colleagues put together an online community service where we got faith leaders from across the country to come together um, and record pieces and clips. And, and, and we put together this really moving powerful interfaith and people who don't follow a particular faith service and that went out and I think it's still on YouTube and I think we've had about 10,000 people watch it. Um, the bike ride again I've talked about that we did that virtually as well we had uh, one of my colleagues mums making gingham face masks <laughs> that's, that's this lovely lady up here uh, this is one of our vicars down here he did his run for Joe with, with his dog um, and again you know just really showing how important it was to try and stay connected during that time with virtual stuff but then the other big side of the campaign was how could we continue the acts of neighborliness and the acts of kindness that had happened at the start of lockdown again happened very organically you know but could we use the campaign to try and really crystallize some of that stuff we had postcards printed where people could write to each other and say thank you or thinking of you uh, and all that sort of stuff so we really focused on staying connected so that was the great get together. Locally, um, and again, I know probably a lot of you will have been involved with this sort of um, work. The local team that I lead up here, we work very closely with the council as one of the community anchor groups, um, dealing with the acute response for people who were struggling to get food or prescriptions. So my team, basically, I just pulled them off all the other stuff and we went on to looking at how we could uh, reach out to people in need. So we work with various other community groups and the council, signposting people towards befriending services, coordinating food deliveries and all that sort of stuff. We put together some packs that we sent out to families who were homeschooling, to older people who were self-isolating. Um, so I had a really sort of on the ground grassroots response as well. And at the moment, we're developing various projects as a result of that. We're looking at something again, which I'm sure you are around digital inclusion, how we can reach people who are, who are not on the Internet, who are totally digitally excluded. Um, we're doing these talking sessions that I've talked about online, getting people to come together and share their experiences of the last eight months, getting them to talk about that and understand different perspectives. And we're currently putting together another 500 health and well-being packs, um, which we've put together to send out to people who are, who are in need. Um, so that's a bit of our sort of short term response, which is really built on the work of the past three and a half years. And I think we just had such a good foundation 
we just had to be a bit creative in our thinking as to how we flip some of that stuff to meet the, the acute needs in the short term. Big thing coming up for us is the great winter get together, which again, for me, will be more important than ever. We've done the great get winter get together for a few years now, and this is where we really did focus on loneliness and isolation. And I think this came out of the idea that, you know, on the TV, we always see pictures of families around the table and abundance of food. Everybody's having a marvellous time. Everybody's getting on brilliantly. Nobody's on their own. And actually, the reality is, you know, we know that Christmas is not like that for many of us and this year it won't be like that for hardly any of us so how can we encourage those connections that we've seen in recent months to keep going during the darker winter months when it's going to be difficult for, for lots of uh, additional reasons particularly the weather of course so we're going to do the great winter get together we're just finalizing details of the campaign but we're going to be encouraging some of the stuff that i've already talked about how do we reach out to people and um, how do we meet uh, meet the needs of those who are most in need, these neighbourly acts of kindness, um, and particularly tackling the issue of loneliness and isolation. So that, that's what the great winter get together will be about. Um, and we'd love you to join in. I mean, that is my main call to action today. We're going to launch the campaign on the 1st of December, and it will run from the 14th of December to the 18th of January. And we've also made the decision that we're going to run it after Christmas, because so much good stuff gets done at Christmas. But actually, January, February, March can be the loneliest months for lots of people. So we're very conscious that we want to run it after Christmas as well. So that, that that's the big call to action today, I guess. And um, right, I've talked a lot there. So if you want to join in with any of the stuff that we're doing, great win to get together. It'd be great to have you on board for that. The great get together, which we'll do next June. Who knows where we'll be? Fingers crossed we'll actually be able to get together. Um, all our contact details I'm going to give you in a second. If you like the idea of setting up a more in common group in your area, that is something I can give you information on and the Joe Cox Foundation will support you with that. Um, you know, any any ideas you've got in terms of collaboration, I would love to hear those. Those are our contact details. That is enough talking from me. And I think the other thing I would just finish on is just saying, you know, I imagine that these past eight months have been really tough for you in the same way as they have for everybody else. Um, and I just say thank you for everything that you've done in whatever role you've got to try and make a difference because it really does make a difference and it often doesn't feel like it, does it? But, you know, we've all worked really hard um, across the country. Um, and I know for a fact, having looked at some of the jobs that you guys are doing, you will have made a massive difference to people. So, so thank you and well done for that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kim. That was that was great. You've got one. Um, I think it, it was a question that was put into the chat box, which was about and you've touched on this, but it was about do you find people who don't go online are difficult to engage or do they start to join in once you set up activities? Any special methods of communication? And a couple of people have contributed to that. But I just wondered if you'd got anything specific you wanted to input. Yeah, I think I'm just looking at the chat now and I think there's some, yeah, I would probably reiterate everything that's been said there. Um, yeah, reaching those people can be hard, can't it? How do you find them in the first place? So that's where I think someone's mentioned leafleting. We often forget about the old fashioned leaflet or the old fashioned letter. My mum always says it, well, oh, not everyone's online, you know. So yeah, leafleting can be a really good idea. And then following up those leaflets with, with some door to door uh, follow up. Um, and I think someone's mentioned that. Is it Anne? Yeah, telephone trees. So phone calls to people, checking in on people and then passing them on. Well, I'm going to phone you. Will you phone such and such? I think that's really important as well. Facebook, again, I don't use Facebook personally. I never have done. But again, the community groups that are pulled together on Facebook are massive. But again, they're not obviously uh, applicable to people who are not online, but there's nothing to stop you telling your neighbours who are not online about what's going on on the Facebook group. So maybe you could be the conduit who is online, who passes the information to people who are not online. So a lot of that is just about knowing your neighbourhood and knowing your neighbours, isn't it? I mean, I know one of the things I did for the great get together was jigsaw swaps with one of the ladies who lived down the road, just really simple stuff. Um, so it's knowing who's on your street and there's a chap over the road he lives on his own as well I'd be very surprised if he was online so again just I just dropped him some biscuits off every now and again so it's it's having your networks and knowing where those people are to find them and then finding out you know what would engage them because the other thing is some people don't want to be online some people are not interested I know my mother-in-law has got no desire to have a computer whatsoever but we have to find other ways to, to keep her engaged with community stuff um, anything else on there? You've, you've got a hand up from Claire. 
So I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, Claire, and Hello. ask your question. Hello, Claire. Hi, Kim. Sorry, my camera. I don't know what's wrong with my camera, um, but it's not there. I am. First of all, thank you. That was an absolutely inspirational presentation. Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. And I've written loads of notes. Um, but I think the main one is, is I run a small charity here called Women Like Me. And, I, you know, your more in common is one thing that when we get together, uh, new women come on board when we're talking that's one of the things that always ends up being said is oh my god we've got more in common than we thought so that is like tick um and because and, and the women like me is about women doing something for themselves because women tend to do things for other people instead of themselves and that's not exclusive to women but um, they do um, before they think about themselves. So it's about, you know, making sure they take that time out. And we do a garden angels. And that is also very similar to your, not similar, it has similarities to your great um, get together. Because that's what we do. We come together and we spruce up and tidy other people's gardens. Um, and we sort of branched off with that by doing um, car parks that have got green spaces which is something that we hadn't had no intention of doing, but have just done a local one. Um, and the other point is really with the, for, for me locally, the council were really quick and reactive to small groups like ourselves, um, because as you say, and this is not exclusive to the voluntary sector, but the passion, the enthusiasm and drive just runs through us with, through our veins. And that just reignited all of that again when, when lockdown happened, as you say, we all just went, what can we do? What can we do? We wanna do it, we wanna do it. Um, and one of the things was that there was quite a lot of women that were isolated um, and just felt so alone. And we worked quite closely with the job center. So we got some names together and we thought, well, what on earth can we do? We can't get them down the allotments. We can't do garden angels. So we made herb boxes or wanted to make herb boxes. Um, so I, I, I literally threw an application, not at someone, but threw it together um, and gave it to the council who, who did bring it back and go, well, can you just explain what it is exactly? Because of my enthusiasm, I just went, oh, 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 oh this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> anyway, they cut through all that with me uh, and they were very, very quick to award us some money so we could um, put these herd boxes together. And I literally just got the addresses, you know, with the permission and I just delivered them um, and left them on women's doorsteps. So I think that was um, from the reactive side of it. I think that is where our council at the moment have been excellent, because, as you say, they probably want to do all this themselves. But they're, they're boxes that they have to be, in, unfortunately, for a lot of them, they can't. So I think it is just about approaching the council and just saying, right, this is the idea. Um, and then then saying, right, well, we could probably fit it in there. And because we have councillors with locality budgets and they're just dying to give that money away. So, as you say, you do need to do a semi risk assessment, but certainly not as much as, as everybody else is supposed to. So thank you so much. That has, you know, um, uh, the the Connection Coalition, we're going to be signing up 100 percent to that, Kim. So uh, so thank you. And just keep up the fantastic work. Oh, Claire, 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 you don't need me, love. You are on it. You are on it. Oh, yeah. People that know me, Kim, will tell you that I'm more than on it. And that's the thing, isn't it? There are amazing people like Claire in, in communities up and down the country. And these, yeah, totally, totally. And it's people like Claire that have kept me going in the past few years because, you know, you meet people like that and you just think, gosh, there is so much we can do. And people have got such genuinely a desire to make a difference and to help other people. So, Claire, I think that is absolutely amazing. I think you also raised a really good point. Um, my dissertation actually was on was on women and physical activity. And it was the fact that often women will put themselves at the bottom of a very long list of other priorities, yeah. um, whether it's work or families and, you know, parents and children all the rest of it and 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 so so you're absolutely right I think carving out that space and time for women to do something for themselves is really important um so yeah I mean that, that's great and I'm going to take the herb gardens idea because I think that's wonderful <laughs> yeah and my it, pleasure <laughs> sharing those things isn't it it's just sharing those ideas and and, and they're often really simple little things like yeah. we got the, the the postcards that I talked about we got those printed um, and the council actually funded that that's where the council around here again can be absolutely brilliant uh, but they just sometimes don't have the time to generate some of these ideas so they're more than happy we go 
goes to them with an idea and they'll go, yeah, absolutely, that's brilliant. Let's do that. So we got these great get together postcards. I'm trying, trying to find one now. Um, and it was just a little thing. You could write a few words on it. One said, thank you. And one said, thinking of you. And just pop them through someone's door. So you're totally abiding by all the rules, but you're just making someone's day by, you know, letting them know that you've thought about them. Um, I might so, have that. Yeah, take it, take it. <laughs> take it. Um, and that's the thing is, it's sharing those ideas. I mean, I, I got really into, as probably lots of lots of us did, jigsaws. And I'd never really been a jigsaw person, but jigsaws in lockdown were great. And then I found out, like I say, this, this woman across the road who was self-isolating, she was a jigsaw fan. So we just started doing these jigsaw swaps. Um, you know, simple activations, again, that, that don't need technology excellent so we've got caroline with her hand up now thank you nicole this might be a question that kim might want to post um into a box and come back to me at a later time and i hope there's somebody going to speak after me because i'm i'm totally absolutely loved everything you've said but i'm going to say something which is going to be a little bit negative and i want somebody to bounce back and do the positive after i finish please so I'm a counsellor. I love that you're smiling at me. I'm a counsellor. I want to talk about counsellor member isolation. OK, because what really attracted me to this wasn't really about the social isolation insofar as the community goes. It's the isolation we and I in particular have felt. And I'm feeling a bit wobbly. Sorry so if my voice is a bit wobbly, just ignore me. But um where I live, we've had um, people have been really concerned. They've got, they were really good. They all rallied round. Then we had issues in town where I live, where people thought we were covertly putting in COVID measures to stop cars from coming in, et cetera, et cetera. It all got really nasty where I live. I had to resign off the parish council. It was all really horrible. So Joe Cox to me is like this dear, dear person who was, um, don't pull faces at me. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So I feel really isolated myself. I need support as a counsellor. There is nothing out there to protect us from what's happened to your sister. And that's what I need to come to terms with. And I need to address and I need to make sure we are not public property. We are human beings and we need looking after as well. East Suffolk Council, brilliant. They do have a wellbeing support network, et cetera, et cetera, out there, but that doesn't stop people threatening to come and protest outside my house. And I'm gonna leave it there because I think you might need to um, speak to me later. And I want this to end on a positive note and I'm feeling wobbly. So please somebody bounce back because I'm usually the bouncy person. Oh, Caroline, right. Caroline, I'm bouncing. I'm bouncing all the way bounce. from Yorkshire. Right okay, down somebody to you. bounce Listen, back. That, that, that's not... <laughs> I would not call that negative, Caroline. I would call that sadly realistic. Yeah. That is what we're up against. And, I, and I, I talked about it a little bit. You know, it's dreadful that people in public life have been, de been dehumanised. You're not Caroline anymore. You're the councillor. Well, the local councillor. I hate it. It makes me sick to my stomach. Um, and we have to do more to try and clean up that 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 side of, of, of politics, local politics and national politics. Um, I'm sure there are people on the call who will be able to help you and support you at a local level. But absolutely get in touch with the foundation because this is an important piece of our work. And unless people share their stories with us about how horrible it can be, then we haven't got as strong an argument, you know, in trying to make a difference. Yeah. Thanks, Kim. I'm feeling better now. I've got control of the situation again. It's just really horrible having to say that in a room full of people. And I know I'm not the only person, but I think we need more protection. I think there needs to be some sort of um, position that we know that if we're getting this stuff directed at us, it's all very well. I've been on, I've been a councillor for 13 years. You know, when I was just a town councillor, it was those horrible people at Suffolk County Council. They're like the other side of the county. It's a building. When I was, before I was a district council, it's those horrible people in Lowestoft, you know, it's a building, but when it comes personal to you in your own community and all of a sudden they're threatening to come to your house in groups and protest, it's no longer a building, it's people, we live here, our children live here and it's all, yeah. So what I want to see is more protection for the members so we know what to do when we are targeted for nasty stuff. Bless you. You've done a brilliant presentation. Sorry, somebody bounce back, please. Well, thank you, Caroline. <laughs> I'm going to go to Steve next and then we've got Rachel as well. 
Thank you. Um, and I do want to pick up on, on the point that Caroline raised. I think, I think it's, you know, I, I'm absolutely aware of the situation that, that Caroline found herself in. And, and, um, but I do think that what we, we do need also to try and um, remember that the vast majority of the public are absolutely behind the work that the councillors are doing and, and all the other volunteers as well. You know, and councillors at the end of the day are, are just, just volunteers like, like the rest of the volunteers that are, that are on here. Um, and it's, it's an unfortunate um, state that, uh, uh, you know, social media nowadays um, amplifies the voice of the minority. And, you know, that's the reality of it. You know, and we, we know that from all the work that, that, that we do. There's, there's a real lot of good feeling out there for local councillors and, and the work they're doing. Um, but I absolutely acknowledge your, your, the issue, Caroline. And um, I, am, I, am, I think, I'm not sure if Sarah is, yeah, Sarah is still on this, uh, still on this call. Um, Sarah uh, 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 supports our member development programme. And, you know, I'll be asking Sarah if I haven't done already. I can't remember if I have or not, forgive me. Um, it's been a busy time to actually look at some bespoke training um, for councillors in, in the way that they can um, seek to deal with um, the, the, the problems and issues and pressures that are put there uh, by some very, very vocal and rude and horrible, <laughs> I don't use those words lightly, um, individuals in our community that just seem to take pleasure um, in in trying to make other people feel bad for the for the good that they're trying to do. So you know you you absolutely have my support, Caroline, and uh, and you know anything that we can do as a council, and we will absolutely do. Um, thank you. Thank thanks, um, uh, Jack. Right. Uh, Kim. Thank you. Can we go to um, Rachel now, please, Council Councillor Smith Lloyd? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm a colleague of Caroline's. Um, we're in the same political group as well, and I've got to know her through this, and like to think of her as a friend for sure. And I just want to say, Caroline, you know, I'll try not to start crying, but my heart's racing, and yours probably was when you just said what you did, because I know how brave that is you to do that now in this arena and, and I'm not going to take over don't worry Kim you know or, or, or Nicole anybody else but I just want it felt it's really important to say that in this arena rather than because I have had a conversation with you a little bit haven't I when it was going on and obviously I'm here for you but I think it's really important that and the training that Steve has just mentioned would be most welcome but I also would like to see much more of a galvanizing I know it caught us on the hop and with everything that's been going on, this isn't a blame thing at all. I would just like to say going forward, it would be really great to see more galvanising of, of councillors and other people behind each other when somebody gets picked on. Because that person or that couple of people in this instance have ended up feeling seriously isolated without backup. And that, that is not only horrendous for them, it sends out a really bad message to the wider community, let alone the perpetrators, that, that it's okay. And that it, it, it's almost by default, giving the message that it can continue. And it can't, it's not okay at all, as we know. Um, and I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that that's really, we have to give a clear message, unequivocal message that that kind of harassment is not okay and that it can't continue. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Rachel. I think we've got Jenny next. Hello, everyone. Now, Caroline and I have been on the Beckles Town Council together. I'm fully aware of everything that Caroline has gone through, and it has been horrible. But there has been a positive that has come out of it as well. And it shows that the people who are true to Beckles and their local community really do shine through and put those who have said horrible things and done horrible things, they put them in the light that they actually truly are. And that is why I would like um, to voice it from the side of the, the people of the community who really do have that support and the positive energy. And I wish it could somehow be emphasised for and somehow a voice to be able to 
to show through because social media can be horrible, but we need to be able to voice the positive that the voices that have really supported Caroline, because there are so many, so many more out there and they've done, I'm trying to put, trying to find the right words. They've shown, they've put the true colours of the negative ones into the, into the fore really to show actually those aren't people we want to be listening to. We want to be listening to people like Caroline and going for the, driving the place forwards in a positive light and I just want Caroline to know that people do see her and everything she's done as an amazing job and she is such a loss right thank you thank you Jenny I'm sure Caroline appreciates that right I'm going to take one more question has anybody got a burning question for Kim and then I'm going to give Kim the final word anybody got anything else can't see any other hands up no okay well back to you then Kim we've we've got about three minutes left until you need to leave us um before you do big big massive thank you from me I think there are lots of ideas in there that that we can pick up and run with us as East Suffolk Council I think lots of things that build on um things that are already happening but you know lots of really good I- ideas there so thank you so much so any final thoughts from you just to say a huge thank you to everybody um and I, I you know I would say Caroline well done for being so brave that was that was hugely impressive to see and I, I think you know people said to me after Joe was killed oh why don't you be the MP why don't you stand to do it and I was like really really how could you even think that that would be on my radar um, and anyway, the, the, and, and that was obviously back in those days. But 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 looking back now, I, I think you are all so brave, men and women on this call, who put yourselves forward into these positions. Because sadly, nowadays it is riddled with abuse and horribleness. But I think what Jenny said is absolutely crucial. They are a small minority of people, and sadly, I've learned some people just want to moan, some people just want to be horrible, and unfortunately. It's very difficult to reach them. I think definitely look at the safety issues locally around what what is available to you. I think that's really important. Um, And I think also what I've tried to do, as you saw today, whenever I talk about Joe, I talk about her as a human being. And and this is, I think, one of the the things that needs to change. We do dehumanise people in public life. And we also end up with this narrative of they're all the same. And and all these things are really unhealthy and really just not fair. So I talk about Joe being a mum. I talk about her being a sister, about her being a daughter. And if there's anything that the council can do to support rehumanizing you know the people who have got these public positions and, and are doing their best and, and particularly in the crisis this is why I'm trying to get people to share their stories because you're doing your roles as councillors or whatever else you are but you're also looking after your own families and you're also trying to get through it in your own way as well and that goes for the police it goes for the nurses it goes for everybody it's the one thing that has leveled us all isn't it and we're all just trying to find our way through it so if there's anything you can do to sort of try and you know present everybody is a human being which is again why I said what I said at the start I'm not talking to you as councillor so-and-so or, or whatever you know, I'm talking to you as Rachel or Jenny or Steve or, or Judy you know that's who I'm talking to you as and I think sadly when you enter public life that gets forgotten and that's something we really really need to think about I hope I've given you some ideas for stuff that you can do at community level like I say for me I am not an expert I'm really honest and open about that I've just tried to get through what's happened to me in the best way that I can. I have been inspired by so many people to do that. And I've now been inspired by all you lot as well, who are doing pretty amazing things down there in East Suffolk. I really do hope at some point I can come and see you in in real life, um, because that would be really, really lovely. But thank you so much for your time and genuinely keep up the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Kim. Big clap for you. Thank you very much for, for all you've done. Thank you.